The king was ruining life in South Carolina. Everybody talked about it. But no one spoke out loud. We did not enjoy freedom of speech. If you spoke out loud about the king, why, you risk being thrown into prison. There was one man who was not afraid to speak out. His name was Christopher Gadsden. He was one of the leaders of a fiery group called the Sons of Liberty. He was a great speech maker. Some people said he looked like a hawk or an eagle. Other people said he looked like a buzzard. Slick, bald head, long hook of a nose, beady black eyes. Any day the weather was good, you'd find Mr. Gadsden standing under the big spreading Liberty Oak. In the shade of that tree, he would gather a crowd and he would make speeches about the king. One day, he made a long list of all the things the king had done to ruin life in the South Carolina colony. Do you know, said Mr. Gadsden in his gravelly voice, your homes are not your own. The king can take them from you. It was true. The king had sent soldiers to Charlestown, South Carolina, to protect the colony from Indian attack or foreign invasion, but he didn't bother to build barracks for them. If the soldiers needed a place to live, they were allowed to march right into your house, sleep in your bed, eat your food, take your horse and wagon for their work, and they didn't have to pay for anything they used. Sometimes you got your home back, other times not at all. Do you know, said Mr. Gadsden, the taxation the king is charging this colony is equal to highway robbery. Ah, yes, the taxation had become burdensome. There was a tax on tea. Just like the city of Boston, we had thrown our tea into the harbor in protest. There was a tax on paper called the Stamp Act. There was even a church tax. Yes, the king is robbing from your churches. Everyone had to pay tax to the king to build his own church in London. Even if you didn't believe like the king, even if you didn't worship at all, you still had to pay church tax to support his religion. People were outraged. Finally, South Carolina sent messages to the king of England saying so. And then the king sent soldiers to attack our colony. He feared rebellion. We were just on the eve of the American Revolution. And he thought if he sent many, many soldiers to attack Charleston, South Carolina, he could squelch this rebellion business before it even got started. Our men in South Carolina knew the king would send soldiers to attack, and so they did their best to prepare. They climbed into small boats, dinghies, bateaus, canoes, dories, and they rowed across the Cooper River to Sullivan's Island. In those days, Sullivan's Island was completely deserted. There was nothing there except some scrub oak and palmetto trees but it'd make an excellent location for a fort to protect the Charlestown Harbor. Men worked for weeks, cutting down trees and rolling the big logs down to the beaches and stacking them up facing the Atlantic Ocean. And then they stacked a row of logs down the left side, another row of logs down the right side. It was hard work. And after several weeks of camping out there on the island, the men started to complain. They would say things like, we're tired of eating campfire food, fleas and sand gnats biting us. Let's get in our boats and go back across the river to Shepherd's Tavern in Charlestown, and we'll get all cleaned up, get a nice bath and a good set of clean clothes, and then we'll have a dancing party and uh, make friends with some of the ladies. No, no, this was not the time for making friends with the ladies. A war was about to start, and we had to be ready. Colonel Moultrie, the leader of those men, made the men stay right there and do their duty. They went back into the woods and cut enough trees to build another row of palmetto logs right behind the first one. And then they packed a space in between with sand. By the time they finished, they had a fort with walls about 10 feet tall and 16 feet thick. They had not finished a minute too soon. One afternoon, a young fellow stood up on top of the fort wall, and as he looked out over the horizon, he thought he saw billowing clouds. Maybe a storm was blowing up. But those weren't clouds at all. When Colonel Moultrie called for his spyglass and he looked out over the horizon, he could see those were the billowing sails of ships, nine great ships flying the king's flag. Soon South Carolina was about to be attacked. The soldiers from England were arriving. Colonel Moultrie had all the men scramble inside the fort and they started to push their cannon into place. Using his spyglass, Moultrie counted the great guns aboard the ships. There were 300 huge cannon. They stuck out the sides of the ships like big jagged claws on a dragon. 
Inside the fort, the men took a quick inventory. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. They only had 40 cannon and two of them didn't work. They were broken. So they really only had 38 guns. And aboard those ships, there were 300 great guns. And now the ships were so close, even without a spyglass, you could now see the men on the decks of those ships. Those boats were crawling with red coat soldiers, long fancy wool uniforms, Muskets at the ready, bayonets fastened on the top. It was obvious what their plan was going to be. They were going to come as close as they could to the island, fire on the fort, blow the logs apart, and then the soldiers would get off the ships, march through the shallow water, and attack the men that remained with their guns and bayonets. Our men were so frightened, they just wanted to run a white flag up on the pole and surrender. They didn't even want to get into an engagement. But Colonel Moultrie said that he was not going to surrender his fort without a fight. And so he waited for the ships. Soon they were so close you could yell to the men standing on deck. Moultrie climbed to the top of the fort wall and he called out, You have entered the Charlestown Harbor. We have made our grievances known to your king and we are no longer loyal to his government. Remove your ships from these waters. Now the commander of that British fleet, a Mr. Peter Parker, was no fool. He could see the men inside that fort they didn't even have proper uniforms. Why, their fort was not even complete. The back side, that wall hadn't even been finished. He yelled back to Colonel Moultrie, I'll not surrender His Majesty's Navy to a bunch of ragtag ruffians from South Carolina. Now we had been insulted. Our men wanted to shoot, but Moultrie told them to wait. Wait? What were they waiting for? Ah, Moultrie had an excellent strategy. He knew those ships were running dangerously close to shallow water, very near a sandbar. And if they struck ground and got stuck in the mud, then they'd be right in front of our guns. He'd have them right where he wanted them. And being stuck, they would not be able to get away. And so Moultrie held off his men. Well, the British grew tired of waiting, and finally they fired a salvo. Many, many cannons all booming at the same time. When the cannonballs came whistling through the air, they slammed into the side of the fort walls. But the palmetto logs were so soft and spongy that the cannonballs just boink, bounced right back off again. Did no harm whatsoever. And lots of that cannon fire flew across the walls and landed in the dirt behind the fort. Men scrambled out, grabbed those cannonballs, and rolled them into a hot roaring fire. Soon they had bright red hot shot. Using iron tongs, they picked up the bright red hot shot, stuck it into the mouth of their own cannons, and then bam, shot it back at the British. When the red cannonballs struck the side of the wooden ships, fiery splinters flew in a hundred directions. Those red coat soldiers went dancing around the decks of those ships like monkeys in a frying pan. They were banging into one another, screaming and yelling and cursing. One ship caught fire and the rigging was burning down on the men. They had to leap into the water and swim to another boat to rescue themselves. All afternoon, our men kept the cannon fire hot. Pow! And then eventually three of those ships did strike that sandbar and the decks of those ships listed right toward our guns. Pour it on, yelled Moultrie. Give them a crack they won't soon forget. Let them hear from South Carolina. All afternoon, those men were dodging cannonballs left and right. And finally, when the tide came up and they were able to float, the ships started to move away from our fort. One young man jumped up from his position behind his cannon. Some people say it was Francis Marion, the famed swamp fox, the revolution. He wiped the sweat from his forehead and yelled out to Colonel Moultrie, they're in retreat, sir. May I give them a parting shot? Yes, said Moultrie. Give it to them, give it to them well. Never let them forget Fort Sullivan and South Carolina. As they were aiming that last cannon shot, Peter Parker, so angry, that he had lost this battle to a bunch of ragtag ruffians from South Carolina, leaped up onto the rail of his ship, whirled around, and flipped his coattails toward Francis Marion. It was not a very gentlemanly thing to do. They aimed the cannon very carefully. When the cannonball flew through the air, it whizzed right between his knees and bam, ripped his pants right off his body. Mr. Parker was exposed to the elements in a most embarrassing fashion. He was not wearing any underwear. And worse than that, his feet flew out from underneath him. He hit the deck on his bare British backside and slid the entire length of the ship, collecting splinters as he traveled. 
He had to scramble below to have a ship's surgeon pick all the splinters out of his backside, and then he had to have his legs wrapped in bandages. By the time he was back up on deck, the ships were out on the Atlantic Ocean, and we were safe from our enemies. Our men jumped into their little boats, and they made for Charlestown. There was a big torchlight parade, and one man sat down and wrote a celebrational song. Mr. Peter Parker had his pants blown off in the battle just today. He made such a rumpus that we shot him in the bumpus, and now he's gone away. Oh, Mr. Peter Parker had his pants blown off in the battle just today. He made such a rumpus that we shot him in the bumpus, and now he's gone away. Someone wrote a full account of the battle, and a courier carried this letter to Philadelphia where our founding fathers were debating whether or not we should declare independence as an entire nation. When they heard that we had won the Palmetto Log victory in South Carolina, they went right ahead and unanimously voted to declare independence and sign the Declaration of Independence. And the rest, well, as they say, is history. <laughs>